Maximilian uh, Hull, born in 1720 in Hungary. Uh, to a, his father was a mining engineer. His brother went into the mining business as well and was an engineer. A lot of science in the household early on. He uh, ends up studying philosophy, astronomy, mathematics, and theology. Smart guy. Mm -hmm. And devotes most of his career. He lived to be about, I think he lived to be 72, which, you know, back then, that was pretty old. Yeah. Um he, uh, he devotes most of his life to his faith as a Jesuit. He was a, he was a Jesuit priest and to working mostly on astronomy. He um, was widely acclaimed as a scientist, was asked to do um, astronomical charting, uh, different projects for the King of England, the King of Denmark, um, and uh, some other organizations. Um, but what a lot of people know, so most people think of him as this scientist guy. They named a crater on the moon after him, stuff like that. He had this little side project. And in this side project, he was interested in how magnetism could affect the body. And so he, on the side, would do these experiments and um, he would study uh, magnetic uh, force in, in the use of medicine. So are you familiar with the term lodestone? I've heard of it, but I think it's because a video game was named Lodestone. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. Yeah, so I, I didn't. I had never heard that term. I guess in the old days, they didn't really make magnets, right? They found them naturally. Lodestones are these naturally magnetic stones. And what he did was he took these lodestones, and he would. Um, it, I and I haven't found a full explanation, but somehow he would use them with metal plates and position them around joints and stuff like that. And he was trying, he had, he suffered from um, arthritis, rheumatism. And so he would use these magnets to alleviate his, his symptoms. And I guess he was pretty successful with it. And because he was a scientist and trusted, people would come to him and he would use um, these magnetic systems that he had developed to help other people with a, a small variety of maladies. So... He draws the attention of a young Franz Anton Mesmer who uh, had attended a Jesuit college in Europe and so had heard of uh, Father Hell's work as a Jesuit and a scientist. And Mesmer went and, uh, and studied under him. So we'll do a separate episode on, on Mesmer at some point. But so Mesmer where the term mesmerized comes from, um, studied under Father Hell. Father Hell, a uh, very scientific man. Of course, his science was wrong. He didn't know that at the time. You know, he thought he was getting results from these magnets, but it was just the power of suggestion uh, that was creating relief for himself and for other people. But he sort of s helped start that process of examining the way that these things might work and it really sort of starts with him uh, in the 1750s, uh, 1760s and 70s, um, uh, through that period of his life. And uh, it extends from there all the way forward, you know, for pretty much like 100 years. It goes all the way forward into the mid to late 1800s with people like James Braid. So Father Hell's contribution is a pretty important one. Um, yet not very talked about uh, in hypnotic circles, as far as I'm aware. So that's interesting, magnet. right? Yeah, and the magnet thing comes in and out of vogue, right? Yeah. There's still people I see commercials today for magnetic bracelets and stuff. Yeah. What do you think that's all about? Why are people fascinated with the magnets? Oh, they're magnetic. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> You know, people uh, people think in metaphors, right? And so, if you give someone the concept that something is magnetic, they're going to think gen generally in it's an attractive force. They'll think that it's a gravitational force that it's it's pulling things. Uh, from there, even your scientific-minded people will be like, "Well, my you know my blood cells have a charge to them. My DNA is negative and whatever." And 
you know, people's imaginations sometimes get fuzzy, gets fuzzy around the edges, you know? Did you get any kind of conclusive stuff that would come up ever in med school that would say that, like, magnetic stimulation could uh, could could help people with maladies, with, with different illnesses? Because uh, to me, it's not so much of a... Like, I know magnetic are, stimulation. We do do TMS. Right. But that's a whole lot of magnet. <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not a lowstone. That's swag, you know? <laughs> And you know, you you think about it. Uh, electroconvulsive therapy works, and and e which you know, electricity and magnetism are sort of like complementary forces. Uh, and EKG, not EKGs, uh, cardio conversion works. You know, you you apply enough electric uh, shock to someone at the right places, you're going to get your results. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think there's certain things like you think about uh, even fMRIs. You know, we're we're in fact lining up the water molecules and you know watching that it's just when you take the analogy that's a huge magnet though yeah man right <laughs> yeah yeah it's not no lodestone man yeah interesting i still right there's this part of me this sort of dreamy part of me that's like yeah but it's, it is magnetic is it about scale or is it about like we yeah you know yeah i do it i do it too i, I wonder <laughs> if maybe they were just on to something and they didn't know how to properly explain it. Even if it was just a tiny little version of it. I can't help but wonder. Yeah, that's the power of suggestion, dude. Right, that's the power of suggestion right there. That's how we're going to wrap it up. We're going to end it right there.